I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Maria Smirnova, Senior Portfolio Manager at Sprott Asset Management, who's a sub-advisor to Nine Point Partners. Thank you so much for being here online with me to talk today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we're catching up from our last conversation about three months ago. And at the time, you shared with us three gold catalysts that we should keep an eye on. There was fiscal policy, monetary policy, and geopolitical tensions. Looking at those first two, which are fiscal and monetary policy, I wondered what developments we've seen there since our previous discussion, and have those developments moved gold in the way you might have expected? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of the catalyst that we discussed. Um, and in terms of the fiscal and monetary stimulus that I discussed last time, nothing's really changed. If anything, I would say that you know, we now have a new president in the United States um, who's proposing all kinds of fiscal stimulus. We have a new U.S. Secretary of Treasury, Ms. Janet Yellen, who is also proposing all kinds of uh, ideas. So if anything, the fiscal side of things has an improved outlook for gold and silver in the sense that if we have more proposals for trillions of dollars of stimulus, that only should be good for the metals. On the monetary side, um, you know, it's also been a little bit status quo, but, you know, the Fed keep, keeps reiterating and the ECB keep reiterating that their stances are very, um, you know, they have dovish stances. They, ha they are in expansionary slash easy monetary policy modes. Um, and again, that should be very positive for gold and silver. Now, what we've seen in the metal prices themselves is a bit of a correction, in fact, or I would say consolidation. Um, you know, particularly in gold, what we've seen is, you know, we've come off, uh, come off the highs that we saw last year in August. Um, but honestly, in terms of the background picture, if anything, you know, things have been moving in the quote-unquote right direction for gold and silver. Okay, well, that's great to hear. And moving on to that third catalyst for gold, which was geopolitical tensions, have we seen much in that respect since we talked previously? I think that, you know, the, the world has focused on uh, dealing with the, the um, kind of fallout from the COVID crisis. Uh, what we're seeing is, you know, the, the deployment of vaccines. So everything has been actually pretty quiet on the geopolitical uh, front, which is quite encouraging if you're a human being, right? Um, you know, one area I would be watching, though, on that front is the trade relations be between various countries. You know, um, I've spoken in the past about uh, the China slash U.S. United States tensions, trade tensions, um, similarly between the United States and European trade tensions. Um, and, and frankly, we haven't seen a uh, kind of thawing in that. But we haven't also seen a lot of headlines because I think everyone is focusing on other issues that are more pressing at hand right now. Right. So all of those three catalysts that we talked about before for gold seem to be still relevant right now. Are there any adjustments you would make, any other things you would suggest to keep an eye on as we head into 2021? Um, no, honestly, our, our thesis uh, our longer term thesis for gold and silver remains. We stand behind the fact that we do think these metals should be, should do well going forward. And simply as I view them as currencies, hard assets that cannot be devalued or debased. And ex that's exactly what the rest of the world is doing in terms of their fiat currencies. Um, they're, you know, again, by trying to stimulate uh, their various economies, they're trying to create liquidity for the markets and for the economies, and uh, that is devaluing the respective currencies. But, you know, we're not making much more gold and silver anytime soon. You know, there's a limited supply. So from that perspective, we, our thesis in, is intact and we still believe in it. Perfect. So with all of that in mind, do you have an idea of where the gold price may be going this year? <laughs> Honestly, I um, no, I don't. Um, I have seen all kinds of different projections, starting from twenty three hundred dollars to I just heard one at ten thousand uh, dollars. Now that may be not this year, 
but these are the longer term projections. Um, but so no, I, I don't, my crystal ball is broken in terms of short term fluctuation. One thing I do say and keep in mind is things do not go up in a straight line. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, like I said, what we're seeing now is a bit of a consolidation, but I wouldn't let that put me off from our longer term thesis. Okay, I also want to, of course, discuss silver. It's having an extremely interesting time right now because of the attention surrounding everything going on with Wall Street bets and Reddit and how that situation is developing. Do you think that attention will last or is this more of just a flash in the pan for silver? <laughs> it's very hard to, um, to predict that. Um, I think that the, the extremely volatile move that we saw on, mon on Monday did reverse itself on Tuesday and has been reversing itself this week. Um, so I do think it's a more of a flash in the pan. However, the one positive outcome of that is uh, the fact that it has brought new eyeballs to the space. And we have had new inflows into this silver ETF. Uh, actually very big inflows. So we're just watching now whether that will reverse going forward or whether those inflows will remain. Yeah, it's definitely a situation that's developing and changing. And as you mentioned, maybe one positive is that there is that increased interest coming into the space. So what would you want those new people to potentially know about Silver's fundamentals? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so besides being a monetary asset or a hard asset, uh, Silver Silver's, you know, other half is industrial demand. And um, we're actually writing an article about this right now, uh, about the industrial growth that we see in, in silver. And it's very exciting. And a lot of it has to do with the green initiatives around the world, but specifically with President Biden proposing his green energy plan. There's, I read the plan. There's so many initiatives there that are so, so you know, so positive for silver. And there are three main growth areas that I would like to point to. One is solar energy, which has already been a large part of the market, but it, we're still expecting it to grow as we move from, you know, carbon-based energy to solar and wind. Actually, it's used in wind turbines as well, but solar is really the big one. Then the other part is uh, vehicles. Silver is used in a lot of components for vehicles, little parts that you don't see, you don't even realize, for example, mirrors and heating um, instruments um, and all kinds of little electronics. But with the move to EVs or electric vehicles and with the infrastructure build out that is required for that, that will be very positive for silver because charging stations use silver. Again, an electric vehicle will have more silver per vehicle than it um, diesel or gas-based vehicle. So again, very positive. And there's, we've seen our research that tells us that that area will grow. And then the third area is 5G networks. And 5G networks are obviously communication towers and infrastructure um, used in telecom. And the world is moving towards them and they do use silver. So those are the three areas that make me excited. And honestly, each one of those areas could provide uh, from... 50 to 100 million ounces of incremental demand in five to 10 years time. So it's quite exciting. The market is a billion ounces um, and we're not seeing a lot of growth in the supply of silver. So to see that potential growth in the demand side, it's quite exciting. Right. And I remember you said before that Sprott is more bullish on silver than on gold. I wanted to check in and see if that's still the case. It sounds like maybe the answer is yes. <laughs> I, it's like picking a favorite child, but um, yes, we have been more bullish on silver, yes. Okay, so I want to also look briefly at the junior mining space and ask where you see opportunity this year, especially considering that 2020 was a year that was generally good for the juniors. They were able to secure financing in many cases. So what are you seeing there? I would say we're still tilted towards the small to mid caps. Particularly, I would point to um, growing smaller producers. And why they are, I think that there's a lot of upside for those particular companies is that at current gold and silver prices, companies are actually making real money. We are seeing companies that have the potential to generate 20% free cash flow yields. 
Um, you know, anything north of 10% free cash flow yield is excellent. So to see those kinds of numbers, um, you know, and we already started seeing those numbers in the third quarter reporting last year. We haven't seen the qu uh, fourth quarter reports yet because that's the year end. Um, we'll see that in a month or so. But really, you know, what we're excited about is, is that prospect of these companies generating real earnings and real cash flow that will translate on paper to their balance sheets and income statements. Okay, you mentioned free cash flow yield is something to look for. Are there any other uh, criteria or markers you would look for that would tell investors this is a good company to be keeping an eye on? Well, you know, when you're analyzing a mining company, you have to look at everything, okay? There's no one specific thing. Uh, starting with a good management team to, you know, obviously geology is most important. Likely the location um, will dictate geopolitics, will dictate fiscal regimes, etc. But also geology is part of the location and, you know, you can't change geology. So you have to kind of pay attention to so many different things. That's a difficult question to answer. I wouldn't say there's anything more important than the rest. You kind of have to consider the whole picture. Okay, perfect. Now, that about wraps up the questions that I had. But before we finish up, I did want to ask if you have any final words of advice for investors as we're continuing on into 2021, the new year. Yeah, well, I think I, I would like to reiterate what I said in the beginning. Um, you know, maybe for anyone who's disheartened by the recent performance of the metals in the last few months, um, I would say we're keeping a steady course um, and standing by our, our outlook. Um, like I said, nothing kind of goes up in a straight line and it's healthy to consolidate once in a while. But in terms of the outlook, uh, we do remain bullish and particularly on the gold and silver equities from many perspectives, some of which we discussed today. But uh, exploration would be another perspective that we're excited about. New discoveries maybe down the road. Um, yeah, so just keep a steady hand and uh, don't panic <laughs> would be my message. That was a great message, and I think it is good advice to end this on. So thank you so much again for being here today to talk. It was great to have you. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Maria Smirnova.